Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the podcast Strikes Back. My name is George and you're listening to our review of Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, the sequel to Guardians of the Galaxy 1, directed by James Gunn once again. And uh, joining me today, as usual, is Connor Hello. and Benjamin. Hello. So, highly anticipated film. Number one has a big cult following, much beloved film in the Marvel franchise. What were you guys expecting going into this? Were you fans of the first one? Uh, yeah, look, I think one for me, as I think it was, was with most people, was a bit of a surprise hit. Um, it wasn't a well-known property, um, at least to people that weren't you know, heavily into Marvel comics. It wasn't a well-known property to anyone. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, I was like, kind of looking at the corner of my eye at Ben. Yeah. It was um, kind of Marvel's first gamble. Yeah, it really was. And it, it kind of came out of nowhere, which I mean, I think that gave them a little bit more flexibility about how they approached this. They kind of were able to give it a bit more flavor. With the music and the comedy. The music, the, the color. I mean, Marvel's been colorful, you know, to begin with, but this kind of just put that on steroids. Yeah. So yeah, I thought the, the first one was, I really enjoyed the first one, um, largely because of, of it being such a surprise and kind of out of left field. Yeah, the first movie was really a bolt in the blue um, it, it was beloved, I think, by everyone who went to see it. I, the worst I ever heard about it was I liked it <laughs> from people. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed that when it came out in cinemas. I probably saw it three times. Uh, great with a big crowd. Um, I think calling it Marvel's first big gamble is overstating how popular characters like Iron Man and Thor ever were, though. I, there was definitely a bit of hyperbole, I think, with Guardians of the Galaxy. Marvel was already on such a roll at that point. But I think Iron Man... He was maybe a, a C or D tier mm. superhero and Guardians in terms of Zed. public awareness. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a Q or something. Yeah. Look, I, I knew, I was very limited in my knowledge of Iron Man, but I knew what it was. I knew who he was. Um, I had never heard of Guardians of yeah, the Galaxy I was the same. before this movie came out. Yeah. And, and that movie really put him on the map. I mean, it, it kind of invented this incarnation of the Guardians of the Galaxy. Like they sort of existed in the comics uh, but they they weren't exactly kind of how they are in this movie. It's one of those uh, examples where the movie comes out and the comics kind of have to play catch up and change to everyone's current perception of them. But uh, yeah, great first movie. And anytime a Marvel movie's coming out, I'm very excited. Cause we're big Marvel whores on this show. Yeah. <laughs> um, especially George, apparently, as we found out last week. <laughs> yeah, that kind of came out of nowhere, the, the kind of Marvel jerk-off sesh. What do you mean? You know I love Marvel. <laughs> you know they're the best thing in the goddamn world. Other than Star Wars, come on. I'm wearing my Force Awakens shirt today. During a Guardian interview, disgraceful. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so like coming into the second one, um, I, always, I had the trepidation that I always have with sequels, which is um, are they going to be able to pull this off with without the kind of um, novelty factor that the first one brings? Um, are they going to just do more of the same and just try and make it kind of... Essentially, I really worry when movies try and do something 2.0. So I, I guess the... The biggest example of that is the Hangover series, which was such, again, was such a, a novel and kind of unexpected success. And then they just copied and pasted for the second one and the third one, and it was a disaster. So I always get really nervous when a, a first movie has success and then goes into its second round. But I thought that Guardian of the Galaxy really, ultimately, it pulled it off. I really enjoyed it. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2? So volume 2, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, and I think one of the one of the key successes of this film is how it builds on the characters and you learn so much more about Peter Quirrell. Quill? Quirrell? Quill? Quill. <laughs> Connor's, Professor Quirrell. It's Connor's job getting the names wrong. Um, steal stop bit. stealing my thing, George. Yeah. Let's go with Star-Lord. Um, <laughs> but in particular, you learn a lot more about Star-Lord. You learn a lot more about Yondu. You learn a lot more about Drax or at least his character is developed. And I love that. The first film was like setting up this character, setting up the team. The ensemble was there. And then in this film, it's, it just adds that extra dimension to the characters, enriches the mythos of where they are in this sort of interplanetary uh, setup. And that's what I thought was the key success of this film. They did it effortlessly. But like, there's a lot of characters in this. They bring back everyone from the first one, a few extra players, and they all kind of get given their due. Like, uh, Gamora had nothing to do in the first one, really, but she gets a whole arc in this one, which is really cool. Her and her sister, Nebula. Who I th and I thought Nebula as well was very much a nothing character in the first one. Yeah. And in this one, 
wow, we get these linkages between the characters. And it's kind of the, the MO of this whole film, it seems, was to be very light on story and just make it a real character piece all the way through. Um, we won't discuss any spoilers until later, but um, it, it, you know, you've all seen the trailer. It's just Star-Lord meets his dad, and that's kind of the whole thing. Yeah. Star-Lord meets his dad, it'd go from there. Yeah, and I've read a few reviews after I saw the film where, you know, they said the 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 three act structure isn't there. It's it's the pa- there's pacing issues and and it's got a weird structure. And I think that's what I love about this film. Mm. I think I love that there isn't like, oh, there's the Marvel villain in the first 15 minutes established and we get this typical Marvel three act structure. I just loved how they took a different approach. I mean, that's one of the things that when I was watching, I noticed was that it was kind of just on the line for me of being, um, I guess, pleasantly discordant um, and a bit of a jumbled, um, I won't say mess, but it was, I think it just towed the line, towed the line for me, which I was okay with. It very much felt like an installment of their story. Yes. Um, Yes. You know what it reminded me of? Star Trek Beyond. I was just about to say it reminded me of a Star Trek episode, which is what Star Trek Beyond was, a really good Star yeah. Trek episode. And I I love that. It felt like a really cool kind of Star Trek episode in a lot of different ways. Yeah, just sort of another adventure yeah. with the Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah, yeah. yeah, And I mean, they really did keep everything that made the first one really good. The The music is a really key... Okay, so for me, the music is kind of in one of the negatives of this film or one of the disappointments. Really? I was humming Pina Colada <laughs> after I came out of Guardians of the Galaxy 1. Yeah. I can't really remember any of the songs in this. Um, I mean, for me, the first one, because I watched the first one, I think twice in the cinema, and um, I went back and I listened to the music, I think that, in my memory, has made it a little bit more solidified. I think we'll have the same experience with this one, where we'll hear the music more and more, and that will kind of solidify it more and more. For me, it didn't need to be as punchy as the first one. You know, the Pina Colada song is, is such a... A kind of iconic song that of course you're going to come out of it humming. I, I was kind of glad that they went the direction that they did with the music in this one. And yeah, I, I really love how it was used in that first scene, which was absolutely spectacular. Um, the first movie was an instant classic, I feel, with so many people. It was almost iconic straight away. So I feel like this one is kind of at its weakest when it's retreading um, the steps of the first one, you know, with the soundtrack or um, certain jokes they try and hit again. Um, I don't feel like it ever feels as contrived as, like, say, the second Quicksilver scene in uh, X-Men Apocalypse, which is just like, okay, they've got to do this again, I feel. Or, like you said before, with um, the Hangover trilogy, where it's just a straight-up remake. Uh, It feels different enough in a lot of ways. But, yeah, there are certain points where it feels like they're trying to just uh, maybe cram in references almost to the first one. But it never took me out of it, really. Yeah, I'd have to watch number one again to really sort of see those parallels because mm. I didn't that didn't bother me at all. I, I enjoyed everything in this film. I thought they notched it up uh, on the humor. This movie was far more focused on kind of uh, that brand of humor. There's physical comedy. There's a slapstick element to this film that I, I, I really enjoyed that Marvel don't really delve into. It's got a different sort of comedic flavor. It's probably the broadest comedy they've they've made so far, I'd say, uh, at least until Thor comes out later, maybe. Um, but uh, yeah, because I watched them back to back yesterday, the first and the second, and the first one is definitely a comedy by MCU standards, but it's it's still very much the kind of mix of action and drama, and you know, just some gags here and there. But this one feels like they were really trying to go for a comedy in a lot of ways. I think um, James Gunn in both of these films does world building effortlessly. It's, it's probably the most world-building out of any Marvel movie, perhaps except Doctor Strange, in terms of just the... the, yeah, the setup that's required. The setup, um, they go into uh, Ravager culture in this. They put an awful lot of effort and time and thought into building this culture, which I thought was very cool. And those scenes were some of my favorites. Oh, yeah. In mm. the film. Yeah, mm. yeah. Yeah, the Ravagers very much felt like the... Pirates from Peter Pan or something yeah. in this film. They were, they were good. Do you guys have any negatives to quickly touch on before we get into spoilers? Uh, I've already mentioned one of the things that I thought was close to a negative, which was that jumbled pacing. Um, did either of you kind of feel as though at any point there were um, some letdowns for you? I got to see it again and really let it sink in. But um, well, it didn't blow me away, I guess. 
which uh, the first one kind of did, I feel, the first time you say it. And it was never going to do that again. It was lightning in a bottle. But um, it just doesn't have that novelty factor, which I think is such a big part of the first one. Yeah, it, it just in a lot of ways felt like more of the same. But when the same is really good, I guess that's not too much of a problem. Yeah. Among problems, that's not too bad. Yeah. George? Uh, for me, I got the typical fatigue, Marvel fatigue, third act fatigue. You're just a really tired guy, though. You can't really get through anything longer than 90 <laughs> Man, minutes. Man, it just goes on and on. <laughs> like, just shave off five minutes, shave off 10 minutes of the, just the, the CGI nonsense. I'm yeah. trying to think if there's, like, a, a good 10 minutes out of this film that I could think of losing. Even if it was five minutes. It, it's, it happens in a lot of these films, and... It's, it happened to me as well in Fast and the Furious. This is another weird quibble for me, but um, I'm, I'm such a big fan of the MCU experiment. And I always come off maybe a little disappointed when when there's not some connective tissue to the rest of the universe. Um, this movie's really like a standalone thing. Like it's just a sequel to Guardians and that's pretty much it. Um, I like that. Yeah, I know. And a lot of people kind of prefer that, but... Uh, no, I don't prefer it. I think it's refreshing for Marvel because I love the world building and, and connective tissue. Mm. But then this film didn't do any of that. And I was like, cool. So these films can kind of just exist on their own. We don't always have to do, oh, and that guy's this guy and <laughs> over there. And, you know. I was really surprised that that's the way that they went down this, um, or that they went down that road because from my point of view, we're getting into that stage of Marvel movies where I kind of feel like every every movie counts to building up to Infinity War. That's it. We're kind of entering the end game here. Yeah. And I was thinking about this after I watched the film, that they have a lot of characters in this film. And they're going to have to tie this into an already packed, like, Avengers cast. Mm. And then Doctor Strange. And then I'm like, I don't know how they're going to fit all these people into one movie. And if it... If two, they, movies, two movies. Two movies. Well, even two movies. I mean, like... How disappointed would you be if Guardians of the Galaxy only showed up for like five minutes of that, those two movies? Be an awesome five minutes. Pretty it'd be, disappointed. It'd be an awesome five minutes, but I don't know how else they're going to fit so many characters and so many conflicting plots into one movie. So like I was, Benicio Del Toro is going to be in Avengers. <laughs> like, Pain. fitting everyone in. It's Pain. crazy. So yeah, I was, I mean, I enjoyed the fact that they didn't really kind of um, stuff this into the uh, greater uh, MCU, but... At the same time, I'm like, oh, how are they going to like, how are they going to bring this back? When are they going to make Thanos interesting? <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe they don't want to have. We kind of need him to be at some point. Yeah. Maybe they don't want to like overstay his welcome. I don't I Like, I don't know. I, I, I can't imagine that would happen. I feel like more than two minutes would be per, not, not too much. You know, they wouldn't films, be pushing yeah. it too much. <laughs> it, it worried me for the future, but as a movie on its own, that, that didn't, that didn't really affect me. I think we all enjoyed it. A few little nitpicks, but on the whole, it was a worthy successor to Guardians of the Galaxy 1 and a nice, a nice little adventure for the, that crew. I think a lot of people are potentially going to be disappointed by this. Um, I enjoyed it. We all enjoyed it, clearly. I think people are going to enjoy it, but that first one really, I, it, 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 people really hold that one up high. Yeah. And again, I don't think you're ever going to be able to um, live up to that first one just because of that novelty factor. That's kind of it, yeah. It's never going to... Guardians of the Galaxy is never going to surprise you now. Mm. Yeah, it's landing in a bottle. It's yeah. just a combination of so many things that converge and Guardians of the Galaxy becomes a cult hit. Marvel hasn't really had to do a, like a straight up sequel like this necessarily before because the rest of the, the MCU is so, uh, they all kind of iterate on each other in little ways, whereas this is really its own little corner of the universe. It's kind of only a sequel to Guardians. Yeah, I feel like Iron Man is probably the closest thing to a direct sequel that we've had iron man 2 iron man 2 yeah yeah but but but, but that was so much set set up yeah that was that, the most i mean yeah you're right universe you're right. building out of yeah. everyone um of all of them maybe thor 2 i don't know i'm trying to think of uh, of sequels that really felt like sequels well, but but everything in phase two was a sequel to the avengers yeah. yeah so nothing was really a sequel to its own first film yeah um whereas this is just a sequel to guardians yeah, yeah i feel they, like you're very right that is it's it a good is. observation they, they i'm really interacted. yeah i'm very observant <laughs> I'm, I'm real clever like that <laughs> well done Ben thanks we're giving you 10 points there hey a cookie <laughs> so um, we're gonna make a very clear line here I think we're gonna move on in spoilers from here on in people that haven't seen it uh, beware fuck off yeah <laughs> um, no come back <laughs> uh, we'll come back after you've seen it pause now come back when you're done yeah <laughs> go, go watch it get in the car go to the cinema watch it and come back and listen so I think the first 
big spoiler is um, Ego. Ego, the living planet. Yeah. He is the villain of the piece. I really dug this character. Mm. Yes. I thought it was such a cool... Concept. A cool concept, a cool way for the, the universe to go. I know that they kind of dealt with these celestial beings in other in other films, like Doctor Strange, they kind of dealt with this. Um, but I mean, they, they weren't characters. They yeah. were omniscient kind of powers. And this guy's just a deadbeat dad. Yeah, this was a <laughs> character. Like this was a celestial that that was more than just this kind of, you know, far off referenced evil. Flo- floating decapitated head in space. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I, f- I feel like, I hope that this is how they tackle um, what might be death in Thor Ragnarok mm. um, as a character and an actual kind of villain. But yeah, in, in terms of how that character progressed, how that, the, the world building, I loved it. Whether or not he has a penis. Oh, what a fantastic conversation. <laughs> like just, I feel like that was, this movie really relied on that kind of dry, would you call that dry humor? Drax's humor. Drax, yeah. Drax humor, I would call it. Drax owned this movie for me. He was such a standout. Drax the Destroyer. Right, that's his name. Yeah, he doesn't do much destroying in this, but he steals the show. Yeah, and yeah. I think that's a testament to Dave Bautista's performance and the script and the the humor that they carved out and created for this character because it worked every time. I thought there wasn't one joke that didn't land for Drax, in my opinion. Great in a big theater. Such an interesting casting choice with that guy. Just getting such such a non actor with such an off kilter delivery of everything. Yeah. And he's just hilarious. It really does show how this movie is a character piece. It's not, I mean, so much of this film um, had big, big sections of it without any large amount of action that were really just reliant on on dialogue and acting. And, and I thought that it was really well pulled off, particularly that um, there's a, a big chunk of that on on Ego when they're on the planet that I thought was really well done yeah i think going back to ego i loved the world building and the the mechanic of how his character worked and what his um motivations were literal world building yeah yeah and the reveal of the all these different species he had had all these different children yeah that Mm. was grim oh it was so fascinating and it just had this grandiose interplanetary, interstellar, cosmic scale to it that I loved. Yeah, while also making him a character. I yeah. think that's why this it got pulled off so well because as I said, like you get these, if you get a god, like these kind of you know, entities and powers, it's so hard to give those entities and powers character. Um, but these guys, they, they, they developed a system that, that works. It, it, it almost distracts you from the fact that his plan is just making big blue CGI blobs all over the universe. Yeah. <laughs> which was Apart a bit from whatever. That. Yeah, that was a bit. Yeah. Do you reckon they'll um, reference that in the next? I, I, someone has to say something, surely. Yeah, that was a, weird. A giant what the hell blob. is that? Yeah, like, yeah. Hopefully There'd been turn no up context on... outside, of, outside of what was going on. Actually, on actually, no, very interesting point about this movie. It's set in 2014, so it's already well, well and truly passed in the MCU. Oh, Really? Oh, yeah, yeah, because it's the, the op- it opens up in 1980, then goes to 34 years later, so it's set, set directly after the first film. Interesting. You noticed that? 34 years later, yeah, 1980 plus 34 years. 20, I'm, because not, I'm I, not questioning your ability to do maths. That's not what. That's, I feel like you. I feel like you are. No, no, no I'm no, very no, good no, at like, maths. Um, I'm no, not impressed that you were able to like add. I'm impressed. That like you, I said, that, I'm really interested you, in all the minutiae of the the MCU. Yeah, so when kidding. when when there's a date given, a specific date given in a Marvel film, that's a big deal because a lot of like with Doctor Strange, people were really like, when is this set? No one could quite work it out. Was it before the Avengers formed or after? Do you know when it was set? No one's entirely sure because they there's that one reference that people think might be um, Rhodey from Civil War about the the guy who broke his spine in a in an experimental suit of armor, or, but um, that can't be Rhodey because they cite his age as like thirty something, which is way too young. Um, so yeah, anyway, <laughs> fun fact. <laughs> oh wow! Something that we couldn't touch on in the non spoilers was the CG on Kurt Russell in the first scene. Mm. Was that CG? Yeah, that was. I thought that was really impressive. Really? Was that CG? No, they filmed it in 1980. <laughs> I I almost thought it was prosthetic. Maybe maybe I just wasn't paying. It as looked much rubbery, attention. didn't it? it? It did have that prosthetic look. They were a little gun shy with it, which is probably for the best. Um, I I think it looked pretty good. There was that one shot that was a bit. Uh, with with Marvel, they've done Downey Jr. 
in uh, Civil War. Civil War. I thought that was far more CGI'd than really? this. I, 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 I thought that was, that I thought more. That was I think, flawless. I think that's seamless. Yeah. Close to as seamless as we have. And then also in Ant-Man. Michael Douglas. Michael Douglas. Michael Douglas. That it looks spot on. Yeah. Michael really Douglas good. looks really impressive. So when you do the whole de-aging thing, you, the, I think the, the returns are favorable as compared to creating a whole new character like Tarkin mm. was. So seeing... Uh, Kurt Russell, like it was, it was close to being there. It wasn't quite there, and I think a lot of the VFX in this film, like there, sort of, it's an eight out of ten mm. in a lot of ways. It doesn't have that extra level of finesse. I thought the first scene was like stunning. Stunning. I thought that big tentacle Absolutely monster stunning. looked amazing as oh, well. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Like the tentacle monster looked freaking yeah. awesome. That yeah, whole so setup. But after that, I mean, it has a the Guardians. James Gunn directs the the space battles in an almost comic booky kind of way. It's it's it does it in a certain way mm. as compared to other you know Star Wars or Star Trek. Speaking of comic booky, this movie just fucking ran with the weird comic book concepts. I love that they have the confidence to do that. Yeah. Like like when they in the beginning when they went into the quantum asteroid field, I was like, I'm in sci fi heaven right now. That is oh. such a goofy, stupid, beautiful comic book idea. Uh, with all, yeah, just like quantum mechanic asteroids yeah. bumping off How everywhere. How good was that scene? They, they were there or they weren't yeah. appearing. Pe- Peter Quirrell. <laughs> Quirrell. <laughs> Star-Lord and Rocket going back and forth, piloting the ship. Yeah. I freaking loved that scene. It looked amazing. It, I, I loved how they were very... And this was a kind of a common theme throughout. They had that sense of humor where they knew that it was ridiculous, but they really played into that. Yeah. And I, I don't mean ridiculous. I mean ridiculous in the sense that most sci-fi is ridiculous. Um, but they really lent into that. Like they, the comment about you would have to be the best pilot in the world to make it through that. That kind of overt dry humor I absolutely love throughout this film. Yeah. I think also this film's humor is successful because the humor comes through the character interactions. Mm. Like for example, Baby Groot having to go get the um, Yondu's little helmet thing mm. to Finn. control his fin to control the... The arrow. Love that new fin, by the way. Yeah. Again, what I'm saying about the comic book stuff. In the first movie, they gave him that tiny little one because you can't do that, you know, foot long one he has in the comics. In this one, they're like, fuck it, let's give it to him. But then, you know, going back to Baby Groot, he, you know, it's it's funny. You learn about the character. You love the character. It's endearing. Um, and another example is that spaceship scene with those two characters, you know, going back and forth with each other, driving the plot, adding humor, adding to the character interactions. I think the script of of this film is really where it shines in a lot of ways. Mm, I feel like they put a lot of work into it. I, I like how they um they weren't shy about Rocket, who has a smaller part in this movie, I think, than a lot of the other characters. But they weren't shy about making him just really a prick and kind of doubling down on how broken he is, which they touched on briefly in the first one. And that was cool. It kind of makes him a tragic character. Uh, it continues him being a tragic character. See, I thought his was one of the main plots, or his his development was along that main plot line. Yeah. Um, cause I thought that Rocket really was the one that kind of came out with the biggest arc. I don't know, they, they took him out of the movie for a long time and they were doing that kind of they, portal jump stuff. They did. Um, but nevertheless, I did feel as though he was a bit of a standout in terms of, of character arcs and, and kind of moving the plot forward. Cause I mean, it was really his conflict with Peter that, um, uh, fucked him over at gave the beginning. Us, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, gave us a little bit of tension throughout the, throughout the film. Yeah. Did you, did you guys um, did you guys get any Groot fatigue in this film? No, I no? think they led into no it point. pretty hard. Mm. I wasn't necessarily fatigued, kind of self knowingly as well. When you know he was with the Ravagers and they were like all cheering mascot, mascot, yeah, uh, with him. Uh, I I didn't really either. I think some people will though, yeah. probably. Like, uh, yeah, yeah, they really they really pushed that baby Groot. <laughs> Talking about that sequence, um, Rocket versus Taser face, Taser, Taser face. <laughs> oh man, how funny was that? Yeah, I love that bit. Rocket right. laughing to me has always felt forced. I don't know. I don't know why that that kind of sticks with me. Yeah. Um. His that that kind of very forced humor, um, which I it's think a, it's a real laugh. It's a yeah exactly <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um. And I feel like that fits with the character. Um. But uh, I don't know if I'd say that it's the funniest part of the film. Laughing to hide the pain. Not the funniest, but I, I particularly like that sequence. Yeah. Felt a little contrived having a character called Taserface and then making fun of him because his name is Taserface. It's I love like, that. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah. I don't know, it's for, ridiculous. for me, the highlight for, uh, from a comedy point of stand, or standpoint was them trying to communicate to Baby Groot. 
I thought that was hilarious, that scene where he keeps yeah. bringing back wrong objects. <laughs> yeah. I mean, th- I think this is part of the the place where a lot of people will say that the, the pacing was off because they g- took a good chunk of time yeah. to really yeah. like flesh out that joke. They, they were not <laughs> they were not kidding around with that thing. They let some bits sit for a while. Don't and they? I was really glad that they did. I thought that kept getting funnier and funnier. I thought almost a bit too long for some some of the jokes. But um, we have still so many spoilers to get through. Uh, Yondu. Yeah, okay, right, sorry. <laughs> Yondu has his farewell to the MCU in this film. Um, I'm very sad that Yondu's gone. He's like, very cool. I love that that he had a bigger role in this one. Yeah, and they really enriched his character. Mm. I, I'm sad that he's gone. I hope he comes back. They had to kill him, though, because as of this film, I think he was just about the most powerful character in the MCU. Yeah. yeah his arrow <laughs> that that, that arrow of his, he killed scores and scores of people. I love that bit where he's walking through and all these bodies are just falling. It's just raining dead guys. <laughs> it's crazy. Like, if he was in the Avengers movie, they wouldn't need... Like, why would fuck would Hawkeye be around if this guy <laughs> with the one magic arrow is there? Come on. There were some pretty intense deaths. Yeah. Yeah, very James Gunn kind of gruesome stuff. It, I'm surprised it got an M rating. It must have just scraped through. Yeah, yeah look, the, the the one of the Ravagers that gets um, pushed out to space, they they really didn't pull any punches with the, the kind of people dying in space. I feel like that was d- directly addressing the fact that uh, Peter Quill went into space in the first one and didn't die. Because that was maybe one point of contention a few people had was like why is he allowed to survive in space you know he takes his helmet off and he gets all frozen and stuff and then he's just fine in the next scene so in this one they're like all right we'll show you what space can do yeah (laughs) they kind of like establish the mechanics Mm. you can go out there for a little bit but eventually it will fuck you up eventually your eyes will explode but he's uh celestial right half celestial not anymore that was the whole thing i I think it was really important that they did that too that was cool yeah um, so he loses he, his power. Yeah, he said he that if if the core dies, right, you're done. As you'll out. just be normal. Okay. And I think they had to do that because he can't turn into a giant Pac-Man anymore. Yeah. Well, exactly. And <laughs> and that would kind of again they they have to nerf some characters for for Infinity Wars. They can't have Yondu going around and just being like, well, I'm gonna settle this shit. Yeah. I kind of dig that every, all of the other Guardians are like nigh indestructible, and and Peter's just a dude. <laughs> so it's cool that they've kind of got um, him back now. Post credit teenage Groot. <laughs> yeah, so he'll yeah, he'll be he'll be grown up Groot again next time we see him, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think they they really milked it for this one, but if they tried to do a third film with uh or sorry, a, a second film with um Baby Groot, I think that might be a bit much. Yeah, so after months of speculation we finally find out who Stallone and Michael Rosenbaum are playing. Um, there's a lot of rooms going around that they would be Galactus and Silver Surfer, which I was so into. I love that idea. Really? Stallone as Galactus would be the Best thing in the world. Do Marvel have <laughs> Silver Surfer? No. Well, nobody knows exactly the, the. Well, they don't have. They don't technically have Spider Man either. But no, Silver Surfer is Fantastic Four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's the thing. Um, after the last Fantastic Four movie, a lot of people were like, "Yeah, they probably just traded it back." Like it's certainly within the realm of possibility, as yeah. you said with Spider Man, Connor. Um. So yeah, I was. Yeah, I wasn't disappointed by who Stallone was playing, but he was kind of a you know, whatever. You would love to see a giant head just with Stallone being like. Uh, he's Galactus isn't a giant head, Connor. Well, mostly head, isn't he? Nope. No? Nope. I'm I remember in comics very <laughs> weirdly then. <laughs> yeah, I think you're thinking of Modoc. You idiot. No, I I'm thinking of Galactus, but I just in, Galactus is a giant dude sitting in a chair. Does he have a large head? He has a large everything. It's in proportion <laughs> to his body though. <laughs> I don't know why I keep thinking of like he has just a very big head or something. I think you're thinking of Modoc, man. That guy is uh, a head in a know. chair. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Um and Michael Rosenbaum had like a line, I yeah. think. Well, he's the, he was like the diamond D guy. Yeah. Didn't he say like, we did good boss or something like that? I don't know. Not not much. Not not a very memorable bot. Yeah. But then in the credits, we had the the uh, original Guardians of the Galaxy. That was the original team, uh, Stallone. And uh, like Michelle Yeoh was there as the, you know, she's the, the chick with the hair and everything. Oh, okay. Or when all the ravages. I did not know that there was a previous film. They're not a previous film, got it. They're, they're from the comics, the original Guardians of the Galaxy. Oh, I thought you said that those actors were um, the original. I was very confused. No, yeah, the, the characters they were playing. The okay, characters. Guardians Good. of the Excellent. Galaxy. So, and uh, actually, are um, they going to play more into number three? Well, nobody knows at this point. Yeah. But um, James Gunn has said number three will be the last uh, film with this team, so like the Chris Pratt group. So maybe we will get an original Guardians film eventually, which I'm all for. Uh, Miley Cyrus was one of them as well. Yeah, I heard about that. <laughs> I think she was the little robot head. Uh, other the uh, the only other um, spoiler is really the Gamora storyline, which um, played a lot. Uh, it was a far bigger part than I thought it was 
going to play. And mm. plays into the overall MCU mythos with Nebula's relationship with Thanos. Yeah, that's the biggest connection. That's the biggest tissue to the, to the rest. They had to have something in there. Yeah, yeah. I like how they're kind of um, trying to set up Thanos that way. Just a bit of people talking about him like he's real scary because showing him didn't work. <laughs> it was not particularly intimidating. We'll see. Mm. Um, also, they they made a, a huge a huge reveal, which um, I was very happy to see was the Stan Lee cameo. Oh, how good was that? Which, because there's been a rumor for many years that he's one of the the Watchers, which are the the beings that uh, kind of just observe things in the universe. So those are the guys he was talking to. And in the credits, he was listed as Watcher Informant. So that kind of confirms <laughs> he is the same character in every film. Uh, just checking things out, I guess. That's awesome. Yeah. I loved how there was, and, and this kind of goes back to what you were saying um, in an earlier podcast, George, about the fourth wall breaks being a little bit more prevalent in the newer MCU. Um, there was a little bit of that. Mm. Um, he kind of referenced the fact that he's in all these films. I, I thought it was cool. I, th- I think that that might be a, um, an indication of the direction that uh, Marvel is going, particularly towards fourth phase, hopefully. I, upon watching it, I was... I think I'm a bit over these Stanley cameos. This one might be the final one. Okay. I mean, no, I'm, I, that's, certainly he'll. But I just because just... upon hearing upon hearing the explanation, that that is a more interesting way that they've integrated him. It makes me reassess how I viewed that. But do you know what I mean? Like he comes in every Marvel film. It's like okay, yeah. Like the first maybe ten were good. Mm. Now we're on to whatever twenty something. I think you'd certainly. I I think that this is kind of one of those things where you'd miss it if it was gone. I think so as well. I don't think so at all. I don't think you'd notice if it was gone. Really? Absolutely. I don't. I, I get a I get a, a sense of like commitment every time they do. I'm like, well done for like just going this this length. But I've never been sitting there watching a Marvel movie and been like looking at my watch like, where's where's Stan Lee? He hasn't oh, been in here yet. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. But when when whenever he does come up, I'm like, ah, there he is. Yeah, and that's about it. That's all you get out of it. But I just... I, I like it on the sentiment, but sometimes it, it does... It's like, okay, yeah. Get some other comic book creators in there, for God's sake. Other people help them, you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> no, it was only Stan Lee there. Yeah, he had nothing to do with Guardians of the Galaxy <laughs> ever, as far yeah. as I know. Um, but no, no, I really think this could be the last one just because they finally explain what he is and what his role is. And then in the credits, the Watchers sort of just leave him on that planet. Yeah. They just walk away and leave him there. So maybe that's it for I him. I love their design. Yeah. yeah, it wouldn't be a bad film to end it on. To mm. be honest, it's it's probably not like the apex of the MCU, um, and I think this is probably a good way to um, wrap it up. Uh, where do you place this in your kind of MCU rankings of all the Marvel movies there have been? This one is somewhere in the middle. In the middle, <laughs> I think so. Yeah, um, this one didn't grab me in a way that the best ones do. Uh, you know, something like Winter Soldier just just really jumps at you and. Yeah. Takes you the whole way. Uh, this was, it was good. As I said earlier, it was more of the same. Yeah. I'd, I'd put it like upper middle. So, I mean, up up at the top for me are like Ant-Man, Civil War. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, I'd probably put this in like top those two. <laughs> five or six. I mean, those are the ones that, that jump out. The, the, the first are Avengers, again, because of the novelty and the, um, just I thought that was a really solid film. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'd probably put it in like top five or six. Yeah, I, I would say it's definitely for me encroaching on the top five. I, I think I do prefer to one. Uh, let me rewatch one mm. and then two, and I'll I'll be able to figure that out. I think it would be very important to watch this film, you know, on on a television by yourself yeah. and see how it holds up compared to watching it in a big cinema with a lot of people laughing. I I think it would be. I think there'd be a big difference. Yeah, it was one of those films where the audience got involved. Mm. Yeah, which is nice. I think our top fives for Marvel are going to change a lot this year with uh, Thor Ragnarok and as well Spider-Man Homecoming and then early next year's Black Panther. Yeah. And middle of next year is Infinity War Part 1. So, Hell yeah. you know, we're getting Marvel overload over the next 12 months. Uh, I don't think I've ever... Well, I mean, it's been Marvel Overlord f- or Overlord. Overlord. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, that's kind of like it, yeah. yeah. Um, overload for like the last what? like six years seven years ten years ten years i can never get enough release, release two every month i'll be happy <laughs> mm, bring it on yeah i don't know what people complain about when they say there's too many of these things it's like what six hours a year it's like the best <laughs> tv series that you never had yeah <laughs> Pe- people will watch 10 hours of game of thrones a year and yeah. won't complain people watch 10 hours of game of thrones a day connor yeah. <laughs> yes i do <laughs> yeah All right, so that's it for our Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 review. Thanks so much, guys. Uh, I've been George. I've been Connor. 
I, I have been Ben. Now I'm no longer George. <laughs> we, we switch names every week. 